Hey everyone, uh, welcome back to the channel. Today we have a special guest again. Uh, this time we welcome Steve to the show. Steve today is going to uh, start a video series that will introduce us to uh, phase transitions and how we model them. Uh, so without further ado, uh, welcome Steve. Uh, let's jump right into it. Hello everyone and thank you John for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here and I'm very happy to be presenting this first video about phase transitions as part of the video series about phase transitions. So I'll be explaining what they are first starting from a pretty broad perspective and then narrowing down the idea a little bit to discuss only those that take place when you change the pressure or temperature of a system. I'm going to try to make this discussion as general as possible so that everybody can understand and I won't assume too much knowledge of physics from the beginning. I also want to preface this video by saying that phase transitions are really a very wide and multifaceted topic. There isn't just a single class of theories or a single class of subject to study phase transitions. They're studied in every field of physics. In every type of degree that you know someone might have, they have studied phase transitions from that particular point of view, from that particular th theoretical framework. So regardless of how you might hear about phase transitions, you're really hearing only about one small part of the story. Same thing applies in this video. So the first order of business is to motivate your thinking a little bit first. To do this, I want you to think about change. Change as a general universe driving thing. Indeed, it is inherent and seemingly immutable feature of our universe. Something which happens is inherently a process marked by change. For example, when we wake up from sleep, our body leaves the unconscious state and changes into a conscious one. When we need to make coffee or tea, we need to change water into a boiling state. The car or bus that takes us to work can only function because the fuel inside quickly transforms from a liquid state into a gaseous one, exerting pressure on the engine pistons and driving it. We can consider more impressive changes of the millennia time scale or geologic time scale types, changes which move continents, form rifts, and generate fascinating patterns in rock formations, or the kind of changes that a small mode of dust experiences in the sky, collecting small water particles, falling and coalescing into a gorgeous snowflake. We can even see changes in the form of patterns in animals. As their body grows, various effects make their marks as stripes, dots, or different color gradients. While these seem like entirely disparate phenomena, we can in fact bring them together in some sense. That of phase transitions. Phase transitions are processes that underlie and characterize all these phenomena, not only the change of ice into water. A phase transition happens because there's a change induced in the environment. That is, some event will happen or some parameters will change and the system will change in turn. In the example of a car or bus, for instance, gas can only combust because there's an initiation from the compression or electric energy from the spark plug. As humans, we want to understand phase transitions and how things change, not just so we can boil water and make coffee, but so we can understand the world around us. In the modern world, the science of phase transitions underpins the foundation of many incredible innovations of the world. This includes manufacturing techniques for high tensile steel used in skyscrapers and bridges, lightweight alloys used in the transportation industry, like automobiles, airplanes, and trains, silicone wafers as part of the assembly of computer processors, and the development of high capacity batteries and other novel energy devices like superconductors. So what does it mean to actually study phase transitions? Studying phase transitions means understanding when they happen. It means being able to classify them according to some characteristics. It means being able to predict them, being able to describe what the system is doing, either mathematically or computationally. So at this point in our discussion, I want to begin to present how we can actually understand all of these things, what it will mean to understand all of these things, and start tackling the idea of phase transitions with some preliminary physical intuition. So we will now talk about any of these examples that we've just heard as simply arbitrary physical systems, which are described by some set of parameters. We can then try to characterize certain things about phase transitions and about the system itself. For example, phase transitions can be a liquid transforming into a gas, 
or a liquid into a solid. But it can also be solid-solid transformations. I want to emphasize this because phase transitions don't have to take place strictly between these classifications of solid to liquid to gas or between any of those. And this is what all the previous examples were about. A solid-solid transition can happen, for example, when crystals are transforming to different lattice arrangements. Also, we can talk about phase transitions in mixtures of one or more constituents, rather than simply pure substances like water. In mixtures, we can have phase transitions between different arrangements of the lattice structure, but also where the lattice is in a certain configuration of those constituents. We can also have phase transitions that happen when the constituents are in different concentrations. Mixtures can also exhibit phase transitions in terms of the concentration ratios of the constituents, a good example being eutectics. Now that we've mentioned some examples, let's continue to narrow our discussion and make it a little bit more focused. For many of the phase transitions that we are familiar with and might typically observe, they happen as the result of a change in the thermodynamic parameters, such as temperature or pressure. In mixtures, we can talk about the concentration, as I've mentioned. Eutectics are, these, are such a material that are mixtures of two or more ingredients. And when they're combined in the correct proportion, they result in a substance which exhibits a melting temperature that is less than any of the individual ingredients. But for now, we're just going to talk about temperature and pressure. So the takeaway point is when we talk about phase transitions, it'll be useful to think about them in terms of the thermodynamic parameters that characterize the system. To elaborate a little bit more and try to make this explanation more concrete, let's say we have a particular system of which we can measure the temperature and pressure and volume and so on and so forth. We don't really care about parameters like the crystal structure, which we might also be able to observe. For the purpose of this video, we just want to talk about temperature and pressure with respect to their interaction with phase transitions. So given a system that is initially at some value of these parameters, we are allowed to change up to two of them. The other two have to be constant. If you have some previous background in thermodynamics, this will make sense. But for all intents and purposes, it is sufficient to say that out of our four parameters, we can only ever change two of them totally freely. If we were to change three, thermodynamics tells us that there is a set of different parameters representing the system equivalently to our choice, where only two of those are actually changing. So that is, even if we change three of the parameters, realistically, we're only ever changing two anyways. So let's stick with our choice of pressure, temperature, internal energy, and volume. Let's keep the internal energy and volume the same and change pressure and temperature. We can first plot our initial parameters where the system starts at and indicate what kind of state the system is in. Let's, let's say it's solid, for instance. Now we'll do an experiment and this experiment will begin by changing the temperature. All of a sudden now with no warning at all, we see that our system is beginning to melt. This is a fascinating experiment. We, we will correspondingly indicate this on our plot. Now we say at this pressure and temperature, our system experiences a liquid state. So with this very interesting observation, let's continue our experiment and start increasing pressure instead of temperature. Now, all of a sudden, the substance is solidifying again. Truly fascinating exhibition of nature. Now we must plot this again and say where we see liquid and where we see solid. As very dedicated scientists, we actually keep doing this process, keep repeating it, and find that there's actually a curve on this temperature and pressure plot that separates a liquid from a solid state. There's many different types of these curves and observations that we can make on this kind of plot. And this kind of plot is called a phase diagram. Uh, the, this phase diagram in particular plots temperature and pressure. If we had a system that is a mixture, we might actually plot the temperature and concentration instead it would still be a phase diagram. And this, of course, brings us back to the example of a eutectic material. Here, it shows how the melting temperature of the eutectic substance at this particular concentration ratio is less than the melting temperature of either of the other two substances. I wanna remark that definitely not all substances exhibit this property, but if it does, then it's called a eutectic. So why do phase transitions happen in the first place? The reason the, pro the process happens is because the system is changing itself into a configuration or other form in which the free energy is minimized, where free energy is a notion of how much energy the system can possibly spend. 
Since the vast majority of systems in nature maximize entropy, equivalently, the free energy needs to be minimized. This is probably the most important fact in this video, and I'll say it again for emphasis. By the principles of nature, as we know it, entropy has to always be increasing, or at least constant. So it is simply unphysical for a system which is in equilibrium to be in a configuration characterized by a free energy greater than another configuration that that system could possibly access. When we're talking about thermodynamic parameters, like with pressure and temperature, then we would say that the system is minimizing the thermodynamic free energy. When we start with ice and increase the temperature to 274 degrees Kelvin, we'll see that it's turning into a liquid water, for instance. So finally, this brings us to our statement of the video. What are phase transitions? Phase transitions are a process which occurs in a system when the parameters of that system are changed. The process is driven by the system changing itself into a form or a configuration that realizes the optimal, that is, the smallest free energy. Now that we've been acquainted with phase transitions, are we able to generalize what happens to a class of systems or possibly even a class of phase transitions? Understanding it for a class of phase transitions is exactly what Landau theory accomplishes. This is an extremely powerful framework that makes amazing predictions about how systems behave during phase transitions and puts totally disparate types of systems in the same understanding. And I'm going to be talking about that in the next video. Okay, so thanks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Steve. Uh, that was uh, an excellent uh, delivery. Uh, I look forward to the next video. Uh, for those of you that are still watching, uh, feel free, uh, you know, I hope you liked the video and feel free to like, subscribe and leave a comment below.